I'm Spencer Bailey. This is Time Sensitive. Hey everyone, thanks again to those of you who have joined the Slowdown's new membership program. By becoming a member, you'll gain access to our slate of new subscriber-only newsletters, in-depth stories, immersive interviews, curated recommendations, and exclusive event invitations. If you haven't already checked it out and want to learn more, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. On this week's episode, I talk with Jelani Cobb, who's been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2015 and is the dean of Columbia Journalism School, where he's been on the faculty since 2016. In addition, Jelani is the author of the books The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress from 2010, and To the Break of Dawn, Freestyle on the Hip-Hop Aesthetic from 2007. Because this year marks the 50th anniversary of hip-hop, a sort of artificial milestone, as Jelani points out, but an important one nonetheless, and also because we're in a particularly precarious moment when it comes to truth and the future of not just journalism, but democracy itself, I felt there was no one better to go deep into these subjects with than Jelani. Over the past few years, Jelani has written for The New Yorker on everything from the power of Dave Chappelle's comedy to the vital lessons of Martin Luther King Jr., to our 45th president as a rapper. Always providing great, necessary historical context to pressing issues, Jelani is, in my mind, one of today's most essential writers, historians, and thinkers. Someone whose writing I've constantly turned to for its clarity and shrewd ability to make sense of our complex present. Before we get into the episode, I'd first like to thank our Season 7 presenting sponsor, Lacole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison, Van Cleef, and Arpels. With permanent campuses in both Paris and Hong Kong, and opening this year a third campus in Shanghai, as well as various traveling schools, Lacole offers a wide range of classes, each lasting two to four hours. With a maximum size of 12 students, these courses are taught by a group of 50-some teachers, art historians, gemologists, jewelers, and artisans, all of them experts in their fields. Lacole's teachers bring a specific hands-on approach and a particularly high level of jewelry expertise that can't be found anywhere else. Art history lessons, for example, are based on unique historical pieces taken straight from the Lacole collection. Introductory courses on jewelry making techniques are given by high-level practitioners. And gemology is taught by observing real stones and using professional gemology instruments. You can learn more about Lacole and its many course offerings at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now, here's my conversation with Jelani. Hi, Jelani. Welcome to Time Sensitive. Thank you. I'd like to begin this conversation on the subject of hip hop, mm-hmm. uh, which is, as as one does, yeah, which is turning fifty this year, and and it began in the summer of nineteen seventy three at this party thrown by DJ Cool Herc, as the legend goes, mm-hmm. in the Bronx. And you've been writing about the subject for decades. Uh, you recently wrote a piece about the anniversary for the New Yorker, hip hop mm-hmm. at fifty, and elegy. In 2007, you published this brilliant book, To the Break of Dawn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's start with the present moment. What are your views on the right now when it comes to understanding hip-hop and this five-decade legacy? So, you know, um, the thing about a culture turning 50 years old is that, you know, that's an artificial milestone. You know, humans have... 10 fingers and we're prone to multiples of five for that, for that reason, <laughs> like you know, one for each hand. And like, so you have 50 years, it's a nice round number to us, but we're actually imposing, you know, what historians call periodization on something that by its definition is unwieldy and chaotic and creative and, does all these other kinds of things, just like we impose the beginning in 1973 in the Bronx, you know, with Cool Herc. But 
you know, Cool Herc's family is Jamaican. Cool Herc is of Jamaican ancestry. And so do we place that before him, you know, with the kind of popular Jamaican music, West Indian music that he was exposed to? Do we place the origins, you know, at, um, you know, the Black Arts Movement and the syncopated poetry, you know, of groups like the Last Poets and, you know, the Watts Prophets and, you know, other groups like that? Do we place it, you know, all these things with funk, with it's an arbitrary starting point, an arbitrary finishing point, but it's manageable for us. And so when I think about hip hop at this point, I think really the marvel is all the things that it has been. It has been a b-boy street culture. It's been a fad of the downtown art set. It's been a kind of newly discovered medium of advertising, which in the 1980s, people thought it was revolutionary. Like, hey, you know, we can actually use this as a marketing device. And then it's been all these other kinds of more substantial things, like this means of communicating about the world as it was being experienced by a certain set of people, the people who they called the hip hop generation, people who are my age, born between, I think it was 1965 and 1980, was the categorization for it. But now they're like two generations. They're people who were born after that, who were steeped in that culture, who have their own understanding of it, and for whom the people who we thought were foundational are like, Louis Armstrong is for like modern jazz people like, oh, yeah, I know like he's important and so on. But, you know, I'm really into this. I'm really into that. For me, the thing that I like about hip hop is that so little of it can be contained and that it spills past all of these boundaries. And what started as this cute thing that these, as I say, invisible kids in the forgotten precincts of the city you know, had created now as a mechanism for them to tell the whole world what they think, what they feel, how they see. And I think that that is probably the most amazing thing about that 50-year anniversary. There's this line in Into the Break that this makes me think of, comes to mind here. Hip-hop is blues filtered through a century of experience and a thousand miles of asphalt. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so... I can tell you the backstory for that, which is that that book, To the Break of Dawn, <laughs> was a product of an argument I got into with August Wilson, the playwright, as a young person. And August Wilson, in fairness, had a complicated relationship to hip hop. And, you know, after this discussion, this debate, I later learned that he'd said lots of complimentary things about hip hop and where it fit in the kind of spectrum of black culture and so on. But I think I just caught him on the wrong day. <laughs> there was an <laughs> event um, where he was talking and it was very like hostile to the younger generation of black creatives, almost on a borderline of kind of like evicting us from this tradition, you know, of black art, you know, because there was so much that he found to be distasteful about hip hop. And when he came off the stage, and this was like, maybe like 2000, 2001, when he came off the stage, I said, if my baby don't do what I tell her to do, I'll take my 2220 rifle and cut her half in two. And he said, Skip James. I said, yeah, that's your boy, Skip James. As violent and misogynistic as that is, that is your boy, Skip James, who is a legend to the blues and is not any more violent or misogynistic than anything that happens in hip hop. And he was like, well, I don't know. So we can just like back and forth about this. And I had this idea that like at some point I was going to write this book about the relationship between hip hop and the blues. I was a graduate student at the time. I had to write a doctoral dissertation. And then, you know, when I finished my dissertation and defended it, I was like, oh, I think I'm going to write this book on hip hop and the blues. And that's how To the Break of Dawn came about. And, and, and that is, to your point, the relationship 
you know, the things that people were thinking about and talking about and that the blues encapsulated, you know, the blues as sociology and blues as history. With all those references to trains and I'm hopping on a train and my baby's here. I'm gonna, it was because these were transitory people. It was nomadic people. Like when you read the social history of the South in the aftermath of the Civil War, people whose lives were defined by the constriction of slavery, the only way they understood what freedom meant was to go somewhere. And so there were these migrations and, you know, people moving from place to place to place. Uh, and then when you listen to hip hop in that same way, you're now listening to people articulate what their lives are like a century plus after those bards of the blues began singing about what they were experiencing. And so I saw that the kind of dialectical relationship between those two art forms. If we're going to talk about hip hop and time, I think we've got to talk about flow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which, as you've written, is the science of funking with one's expectations of mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting because Ralph Ellison, he has this um, piece, I think it's an Invisible Man, it actually might not be an Invisible Man, but he has this incredible scene that he describes, you know, where between an old fighter and a young fighter, and they're in the ring, and the young fighter is all dazzle and speed, and he's doing like all these things and you think that the old fighter is just like washed up. And then all of a sudden he like steps in and throws this unexpected punch and lays the younger fighter flat. And he said he had simply stepped inside his opponent's sense of time. And I was like, that's it. That's it. Like speed is one thing and timing is another. And so you have all the speed in the world and have bad timing. Or you can be slower, but have a sense of timing that conveys something. And so what hip hop did when it first started out, when you first like listen to early hip hop, is very predictable. Da 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 You know, um, the rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, you know, rhyme scheme. And as it evolved, you began to see a more sophisticated palette of techniques. Uh, and so when people would talk about flow, they were really articulating what an individual's sense of timing was and how they played with your expectations, how they played with your time. Like you expect the rhyming line to be here, but what if I put it here, you know, or what if I make it half a beat quicker? Or what if I intentionally have jammed too many syllables into this next line so that listening to it, I'm rhyming the first line at this pace and then the next line is at this pace, you know, and you're doing that and doing that. And it's a kind of mathematical relationship that unless you are one, a rapper <laughs> or two, someone who is a serious observer, someone who takes the music seriously enough to actually listen to what's happening inside of it, that gets lost. And because of, I think because of the people who created hip hop, there's this body of literature around jazz where people understand that jazz required a particular kind of technical sophistication because they were using classical European instruments. Rappers don't do that. And so there was this sense that, that these people don't really have any kind of technical sense to what they're doing. And this is all kind of like doggerel. And that's what I was trying to get at when we were talking about, you know, the sense of flow and what is really inside of that, what people mean by that. Where does uh, freestyle or this notion of freestyle fit mm -hmm. into this? Um, the same thing, like with that relationship between hip hop and the blues, you know, um, and other improvisational forms of music and expression, you know, with the blues, particularly with the AAB structure blues, you know, which is kind of classic, you know, my baby didn't left me and I feel so bad. And then you repeat that same line, my baby didn't left me and I feel so bad. And then you know, the next line would be different. This is the worst feeling a man like me ever had, you know? 
the reason why you repeated the second line was that a lot of these songs were improvised. And so you would say the first line twice, which gave you time to think of what the third line was going to be. And the third line was typically the punchline, you know, so like a kind of comical one was, you know, like Red House um, Blues, which, you know, Jimi Hendrix actually recorded. I think I, I quote that in the book where he says, um, I think I'll go over yonder on over the hill. I think I'll go on yonder over the hill. If my baby don't love me no more, I know her sister will. And that does what it exactly what you expect it to be. Like, that's what makes the listener chuckle. It's the irony. It's the punchline. And hip hop, especially early, like freestyle hip hop was built around these punchlines, except they were doing something even more daunting technically, which is that you were only saying the first line once. So you had to actually be articulating a line and thinking of the rhyming line that went with it at the same time. So it's this kind of mental dexterity that was required of freestyle rapping that also harkened back to what blues musicians had been doing. And even like, you know, the work songs that the blues themselves are built on, you know, which people did on chain gangs, you know, where you're building a song around the fall of a hammer. And here, you know, you're building the song around a kind of syncopated sense, you know, someone drumming on a table or someone doing a beatbox or whatever, and you're, you're building a song as you go. Same skill, you know, same technique, just separated by a century. Another element of this sort of time hip hop thing, we can maybe call it like quote unquote hip hop time, mm -hmm. is that it's sort of in the culture so sped up that you're quickly going from one thing to the next. Like mm -hmm. you've written in the lifespan of a culture, seven years is not a long time, mm -hmm. but in popular music and especially in hip hop, it is a millennium. Mm -hmm. You've also written rappers are created in accord with the reigning flavor of the nanosecond. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, I wanted to ask you, how do you think about this music, this art form in that sense? Because there's this fleeting nature to it. And yet some of these songs really endure. They like push mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's funny cause, because I can't even speak to like where the edge is at this moment. You know, nor is it for me to to do that, you know, um, but there's always like a certain portion that gets preserved, that speaks, you know, beyond its moment. And it's like, it's unpredictable, you know, what you'll play that, you know, will resonate with people down the line. But also, you know, when I think about my parents' music and, you know, Bobby Blue Bland, you know, and um, Lou Rawls and uh, certainly Marvin Gaye, you know, and all those, those people are foundational to me. And I think that there are songs that are contemporary for me as hip hop that are now foundational for a whole other generation of people. Like you think about, oh, this, they played this in the car when I was on my way to school, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was reading one of your pieces where you referred to Eminem as Columbine chic, I think. Oof. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Denver, and I remember a whole generation mm -hmm. of kids in the late 90s, early 2000s listening to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I will say, initially, I think I was too harsh on Eminem. Because really, I was writing about the reaction to him more than I was writing about him. And that probably wasn't fair to him as an artist. And over time, I think that's probably been like established. Like he is who he is and he's trying to articulate a particular thing. But when people try to draft him into being like the Larry Bird of hip hop, you know, there was never going to be any good outcome to that, a good reaction to that. I mean, I think it was significant that there was this white person who was articulating this existential angst 
and nihilism, a sense of worthlessness that really had not been associated with, certainly not in hip hop. Certainly not, it wasn't associated with like, wasn't associated with white people, period. And wasn't associated with, with hip hop. And I think that was part of what made him actually stand out. Like, wait, I have to listen to this. And, you know, of course, Biggie had talked about suicidal despair, you know, but it took a long time for hip hop to really wrap its head around about talking about it. So being vulnerable in that way. Yeah. And, you know, with Eminem, it was just like right there on the surface. He hit his line and then we said, how can I be white when I don't even exist? Which was a fascinating thing, which was like trying to grapple with who you are as a human being um, before you can even get to all the layers of things that come with, you know, whatever your particular epidermal pigment is or is not. So, yeah, I think if I look back at it, I probably was too harsh on him, in, at least in my early writing about, about Eminem. Yeah. The relationship between generations and music, mm -hmm. I mean, makes me think about kids right now listening to, say, Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That positioning in 20 years from now. Right. You know, can 20 years, well, I mean, people will say he's classic now, but not classic in the way that he would be in 20 years. And even like then will be archival. And so for him in particular, I think that there will be people who, you know, could delve into the layers of um, meaning, you know, in his work. And like I could easily see someone doing a book explicating, you know, what he said and like what the themes are in his work. Just as like the way someone would examine any other kind of form of poetry. You know, someone wrote a book about Rita Dove and her meaning. I'm just like picking poets, you know, at this point. But uh, someone has wrote an examination, you know, of their work. You'd be like, oh, this is fitting. And I think that Kendrick would probably fall in that category. I was interested to learn that while preparing for this interview, there was the fact that you were listening to hip hop at the time of Tupac and Biggie's murders, almost like religiously, it seemed like you, like you loved this music. And then that happened mm -hmm. and you stopped listening to hip hop for almost five years. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah. a, it was a Roots concert that brought you back out of it. I was hoping you might speak to those five years, what that was like for you to be removed from mm -hmm. the music. Well, it was interesting because one of the great things about hip hop was that it was this forum for black people, but predominantly black men to talk about how they experienced the world and some of the shit talking braggadocio bravado, you know, like that's an art form and you know, to understand that culturally, that, that, that's a culture I grew up in. And even like the purpose that it serves, it's like a psychic armor that people use when they go out into the world. If the world is going to underestimate you or disparage you, it's like, I'm this, I'm that, you know, like you're really like hyping yourself up um, in a world that won't do that. And so I appreciated that. But at the same time, at some point, it became inescapable that it was also feeding into this other dynamic, which I wrote about when I wrote, you know, the elegy of hip hop. People were being murdered in the streets. And it wasn't like this was exclusive to hip hop. The streets were running red with blood in the 90s in black and brown communities in this astounding amount of violence. And you know, I had to start grappling with the question of whether hip hop was a reflection of that or whether hip hop had become causal. And at the same time, you know, my daughter came into my life at that point. Certainly stuff that I wasn't going to listen to around her. And it really gave me permission to deepen my interest in other forms of music, which is actually when I first started really engaging with the blues re-engaging with soul classic music that, you know, I'd listened to growing up and re-engaging with funk, certainly like deepening my kind of understanding of funk 
when I returned back to listening to hip hop again, kind of frequently, first I had missed all this stuff. I had missed the window like where Jay Z debuted. And it just was like this voice that was out there, like, yeah, people are talking about this guy, Jay Z. But also, I think I brought more to the table. Like, I kind of understood the music in a different way, which is why that book, you know, To the Break of Dawn is like a product of that second engagement with the music. I was also interested to learn that your upbringing in Queens, you had what you call the first words I ever wrote seriously as mm-hmm. rhymes, mm-hmm. which you created as the uh, South Queens <laughs> MC trait. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> do, do, you, do you remember some of those rhymes now? And, and as hoping you might share a bit about your life or time as a budding MC. Oh, yeah. Um, first, I remember many of those rhymes. No, I will not ever uh, <laughs> reiterate any of them. They're about like what you would anticipate for a 16-year-old rapper. Um, <laughs> and... You know, I do remember that I was frequently referred to myself as the great MC trait, um, which was funny, uh, even at the time. Also, one important thing about that was that, you know, I learned how to write by writing rhymes. And the things that, you know, my voice, really, as a writer, you know, I have like lots of different voices depending on like what purpose you serve, like it's having different clothes in your wardrobe. But what you wear when you're like most yourself, like that's your voice. That's the thing. And so that is undeniably almost entirely shaped by hip hop, you know, and that sense of kind of rhythm and bravado and dashing sharpness and those kinds of things, those kind of traits. That was what that was. And it was also a reflection of like when and where I grew up. I grew up in Queens in the 1970s and 80s. And, you know, Run and DMC were my older brother's classmates. And LL Cool J was my eighth grade classmate and lived not all that far from Q-Tip and Fife and Salt and Peppa. You know, Nas was on the other side of Queens. He's younger than, you know, that set of folk. But still in Queens, like in that environment, in Cool G Rap, and you could just go through this whole... Pharaoh Munch. Pharaoh Munch, right, who's from Southside Queens. Like, there's a whole geography of all these people um, who were creating this culture. I also have a theory about that, by the way why there were so many of those foundational acts that came from Queens and then, you know, Public Enemy from Long Island and then De La Soul from Long Island and hip hop started in the Bronx and spread to Harlem, like Bronx and Harlem, unquestionably the the birthplaces, the places where hip hop, you know, gained its first foothold. I think that, so, so James, as we called him then, you know, the world now calls him LL, um, told me, I remember this specifically, I ran into him in an airport about five years ago and told him this story. It's like, you probably don't remember this. It's like, one, I remember when you came to school and said that your grandfather had bought you $2,000 worth of DJ equipment (laughs) and that you were in your basement, like using that DJ equipment. He later used that equipment to make the demo that he sent to Rick Rubin. Wow. Um, and so we were 13 at that time. So two years later, that's, that's where that came from. The significance of that story was lost on me at the time. But one, he had a family that had enough disposable income to buy him musical equipment. And two, he had a basement. And it's like the basement for those rappers was what the garage was for the Silicon Valley people, these startups, you know? Which is mainly a space where you could explore and not get uh, on your parents' nerves. Uh, And so all of those rappers who were from middle-class families, you know, they had this Black experience. They were steeped in the same culture. 
but they generally had material advantages that their counterparts in other parts of the city didn't have. And I think that was why so much of that music was clustered uh, in those parts of Queens. The basements. Yeah, the basements. Let's get into your family history and, and upbringing in Queens. Both your parents migrated from the American South. Mm-hmm. From a historical or ancestral roots perspective, how do you think about your family and your parents? So when I was 18, I was at Howard, I took this this course called Black Diaspora, which was required. It was a required course. And in it, we learned about pre-contact, pre-colonial Africa. We learned about the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, We learned about the diaspora, the Black diaspora. We learned about the Great Migration. We learned about the Cold War and the dynamics of the Cold War in the Caribbean and the migrations that came as a result of it. We learned about all of these things, urban renewal, Harlem, the Bronx, all of these things that at some point became clear to me were contextualizing my life. Like, I had never thought about the fact that I grew up in this neighborhood in Queens that was full of Black families that had migrated up from the South. Um, We were the children of those migrants, full of West Indian families who had migrated um, from Jamaica, uh, from Trinidad, from Haiti, you know, significant populations there. And that many of the people who had come, who lived in Queens, had come there from the Bronx and Harlem. And that the civil rights movement had actually opened those doors, made it possible uh, for Black people to begin getting a foothold in the housing market, begin buying homes in New York. All of that stuff, to understand that your life is not happenstance, is not a product of just a random set of occurrences, that there are these historical currents and you exist inside them. And that's how you are here at this particular moment. That's how you're having these particular experiences. That's why my parents were making cornbread and pig's feet, you know, where my other friends' parents are making aki and saltfish. Or my friends over here uh, whose parents are making roti, you know, and all these things. And it reflected those other kinds of dynamics. So my father, who had come from rural Georgia, a place called Hazelhurst, came up in the World War II migration. My mother, who was a good deal younger than my father, uh, came up to New York in the early 1960s. But for dynamics and things that are connected in history, they're very clear. You know, my mother saw a future of clean white people's houses in Alabama and said, no, thank you. And my father really thought that there was nothing ahead of him in Hazelhurst, Georgia. And that he had this idea, which he told me later, kind of laughingly, that if he could just make it to New York City, everything else in his life would be okay. And they met uh, in Harlem. My father was an electrician in a building my mother lived in. And he um, got sent to fix some lights. And he was like, oh, no. I have- <laughs> much more important matters than than fixing the electricity here, you know? And so um, he just kind of kept talking to my mother until she realized that, like, you know, he was not going to go away until he had her phone number. And that was how they met. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. What are some of your earliest writing memories? I know you've mentioned that your father taught you the alphabet, and that's Mm -hmm. maybe the earliest. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so my father taught me an alphabet. That's the story I've told a, a few times, which is that you know, my father had a third grade education and that he was very intent upon me getting more education than he had. One of the first things I remember was him tracing the letters of the alphabet with his hand wrapped around my hand, which is something I've done with my own children, you know, just for continuity purposes. You know, they'll learn the alphabet in school and all those other kinds of things. But I just was like, I want you to have this memory of us doing this, too. And, you know, that is funny because I always tell my students this. I I say that 
we like to escape, to think that we can escape our parents. And in some level, perhaps you can. But your parents also have a good decade to program you before you even know what's going on. You know, like birth to 10 years old and maybe even more. And so I, my father would always give me writing pads as a gift. Like if he was gone or he was coming home from work, he would give me a writing pad and a pen. I don't know that he conscientiously set out to like, or consciously set out to make me a writer, um, but he gave me the implements. <laughs> and so, you know, that was kind of what got me started. And then I picked up this love of reading. And, you know, my mother explaining to me what a metaphor was, which I remember distinctly, and getting the sense of like, oh, like, that's amazing. That's an amazing concept, you know? And that was what kind of registered with me. You've said that your mom read voraciously as an act of self-defense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Could you elaborate on that? And also, was she like shoving books in your hand? <laughs> so like, we did have, we had a reading time. We all had like a time. We had to read for maybe it was like 30 minutes or something, you know. And But my mother was, this is something that was like psychological that I kind of like later recognized. And I didn't figure this out about my mother. I figured it out interacting with other people of her generation, most of them black people, but not exclusively. Like newspapers, and it's interesting that I work in journalism, you know, newspapers serve this function of informing the public, you know, in the kind of classical sense is pre-internet, of course. They serve this purpose of informing the public, um, but they also educated the public in many ways, like a person who did not have a great deal of formal education, but who read the newspaper every day would know that what was happening in this art exhibit. And they would know what bills Congress was considering. They would know what the mayor was doing. And you could interact in the world in an informed way. In public libraries, which I love to this day, and I would say that I I give every year to the Queen's Public Library, because I think that libraries are the most democratic institution that we have. And I mean, we we should wish that our Congress was as democratic as our libraries are. And, you know, my mother always went to the library because she had dropped out of high school in Alabama. She finished high school in Detroit, but that was as far as she went when, in my youth. She went back to college when she was 52 and, and actually got a bachelor's and a master's degree um, in social work from NYU, which she was immensely proud of. But at that time, being able to read and to be well-read, you know, to read the newspaper, to read books from the library, it allows you to interface in this world on, if not equal footing, more equal footing than you would have had access to otherwise. From there, you go to Howard University. You also attend Rutgers for your PhD in American history. I was hoping, could you tell me a little bit about your, I guess we could call it training period, your education? How do you think about your time at university now looking back? Oh, it's so funny. Like, you know, I had no idea what I was doing when I first got to college. Not really a clear sense of why I was there. And honestly, I didn't really think that this scheme was going to work out, (laughs) you know. And so like most first generation kids, I got pushed toward law. It's like you get pushed toward law, business or like engineering or medicine. You know, those are like the acceptable majors. And you know, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. And I thought I wanted to be a lawyer uh, until I took that black diaspora class. And then I became aware of the way in which history could make sense of the world. That, that was it. <laughs> you know, um, it was a course taught by a professor named Adel Patton. And so... That sent me on that path. And it was, of course, a circuitous road. Uh, you know, I said I went to school when I had money. And when I didn't have money, I didn't go to school. 
So seven how, years, right? Seven to graduate. Years. Yeah. Took me seven years to graduate um, from undergrad. And then, but I had this basement apartment, which it was like the worst apartment in Washington, D.C. It flooded, you know, it was semi heated. You know, it was not a great apartment, but it was like my laboratory because during the years when I was out of school and I was just working at bookstores, I accumulated this library and I devoted like every other hour in my spare time to reading and trying my fledgling efforts at becoming a writer. And so I still think back, and not fondly, because that place was a dump. <laughs> um, but I do think about that formatively. You know, like one time I went, this was about a year ago, I was in D.C. for something else. And I just stopped by like that block where it was and just kind of like looked at this building and was like, wow, that place was exactly 30 years ago. And I was like, would you imagine like, if that dude walked out of that door and looked across the street and saw this dude, would he ever imagine that he was capable of becoming that? And I was like, almost certainly not, you know, because I felt like all of those things were just kind of foolish diversions. And so, yeah, and that was kind of it. I got back into school through the intervention of a professor, Elizabeth Clark Lewis, who you know, basically helped talk them into letting me register despite like these outstanding debts that I had. And, you know, got in, uh, finished, and then people <laughs> shocked because it took me seven years to finish undergrad. And I was like, and now I want to get a PhD. And like, are you crazy? Are you on drugs? Like, what's wrong with you? You know, that's going to take forever. And that took seven more years. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing that occurred to me was like, those seven years will go by either way. Seven years from now, I could either have a PhD or not. And so I was like, I'm going to keep doing this thing. Well, I think what's so profound too, those seven years, seven years, it's like the most valuable thing you had was time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially to be on the other side of it now. Yeah. You know, like time was the biggest resource I had. Now I have no time. <laughs> like every single day, like is time is budgeted to the minute. Well, I'm you know, glad we have an hour together. Right. Like, but even this hour, like, yeah. look how much work it took to actually get this hour. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Um, there was some rescheduling. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't I didn't know at the time that I was like, I mean, I knew I had to, like, to do these things, but I didn't know, like, oh, like, you don't have money, you don't have connections, you don't have resources, you have time. And, like, if you use that time, you can actually get to be really good at the thing that you want to do. And that will like help you move through all these other kinds of obstacles. Well, it, it strikes me that we were talking earlier about these budding rappers and MCs in basements, and then you're in this right. basement too. <laughs> I'm in the basement, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've got this great Washington City paper story about mm -hmm. David Carr. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to bring him up because he's a voice that I really hope doesn't get lost to time. Yeah. You wrote a beautiful tribute to him after he died, too. Yeah. Carr was, like, this, like, incredibly original person who, you know, ta introduced me to him. So ta Coates, and I overlapped at Howard, you know, because it took me so long to finish. And when I came back, he was actually just starting. And so we met. I was like, he was this freshman, and I was this super-duper senior. Um, <laughs> and somehow or another, we connected around writing. And, um... And he met Carr and was like, you should talk to Carr, you know? And I was like, oh, okay, all right, you know, whatever. But I did wind up, like, sending him some clips and those things. And uh, he told me to come down. He was like, you know, you come down to the offices. And so I go into the office, and he's sitting at his desk, and the office is dark. And I go to turn the light on. Because I'm like, I don't know, like, what this is. This is an interview, like, what's happening? It's a dark room. So I go to turn the light on. He's like, no, 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 don't turn the light on. He's like, okay. And he said, yeah, I used to spend a lot of time in dark crack houses. I still can't deal with overhead light. And I was like, okay, this dude is not serious. Like, this is like not for real. So he opens his blinds so like some light filters in. 
but it's almost like a scene from like a noir movie or something, you know? And I was like, what, what is happening here? And so he read the clips. He was like, oh, yeah, you're good. You know, um, you should work here. Can you start whenever? And I was like, sure. But I'm still not sure that this is actually like a real thing. And then later I learned that, no, he did. He spent a lot of time in dark crack houses. And, you know, he had this drug problem, which he has been enormously candid about and which was foundational to him in all these other kinds of ways, you know, and what he did. I think Carr was possibly the most honest person I've ever known. And what that enabled was an equal degree of honesty. Like he could interact with people, and that's a, which is a tremendous advantage for a journalist. You could interact with people in ways that makes them make them implicitly unguarded, you know. Um, he came by that honesty really hard, you know, but uh, that's part of who he was. Was that meeting him sort of an entree into journalism for you? It was an entree into serious journalism, you know, or more of an entree, because I'd already been writing at a, a small outlet called One Magazine and coming into Washington City Paper, I got a lot of understanding about the metabolism of a newspaper. Like the New Yorker operates in the same metabolism that the City Paper did with the same sort of functions, the same sort of editorial meetings, like the same. I didn't realize that this was a template that worked at scale that I was being introduced to um, and that Carr would have expectations. And he, he would talk about when we'd done well. He would chew us out when we had and. And he also was really, in, in a way that is now, I think, common to like the best editors, really exacting, you know, like, do you know this or do you think this? And wouldn't allow you to take like the lazy route, you know, to dodge something. You had to double and triple check to make sure that you were accurate. You know, I, I wrote after he died that the voice in the back of my head, you know, all these years later, that says, do you know this? Did you double, are you being sloppy? That voice is David's, you know, to this day. Hey everyone, taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our season seven presenting sponsor, Lacole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison, Van Cleef and Arpels. Lacole brings together teachers, jewelers, art historians, gemologists, designers, lacquer masters, enamelers, setters, lapidaries, mock-up makers, and others to share their passion and knowledge of jewelry with the world. Through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications, Lacole makes the world of jewelry accessible to all. No matter one's experience level, Lacole opens up an incredible art form that has long been reserved for a handful of people. Through a fresh, pioneering approach, Lacole sits at the crossroads of art, gemology, and craftsmanship, and contributes to and consolidates knowledge around the fascinating, vast world of jewelry. You can learn more about Lacole and its current and upcoming offerings at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now, back to the episode. I also wanted to bring up the past and perfect column you wrote for mm -hmm. Africana.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's been nearly 20 years since oh my God. you started that column. <laughs> and I, I was just wondering what, what stands out to you from that particular body of work, which was kind of an interesting time in the internet. I yeah. mean, it was still sort of the AOL era, right? getting out of dial up to ethernet. Yeah. Um, so there were like a lot of us, you know, who had started this column when Africana.com first started, which Skip Gates, you know, created. And I was there. They hired me. Amy Alexander was a columnist. Bomani Jones, you know, who's on HBO now, was a columnist there. And um, Lester Spence, you know, wrote about politics. A bunch of us you know, who were really kind of young in our careers, but I think took ourselves very seriously. And we were writing about race and I think ways that tended to be maybe more thoughtful or more informed than like the general 
murmurs that you saw kind of bouncing around. Really, I think that was one of the like points at which I became more clear about what I want to do, and, like what specific niche that I wanted to occupy. So the the stuff I do at the New Yorker now is a direct outgrowth of the Africana.com columns. And most of those, or some of those columns were combined in a book, you know, called The Devil and Dave Chappelle and other essays. You know, and so, you know, I wrote about the Iraq war and, you know, for that, I wrote about uh, the death of Coretta Scott King. You know, I wrote about, um, you know, obviously like Dave Chappelle, who at that point had a very different kind of profile as a comedian than he has now. And so at the end of the, the Africana.com era, I was looking at all of this work that I had done and I put it up on a website. I had this personal website and this editor reached out to me and was like, would you take all these things down from the internet and send them to me so we can make a book? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> I was like, not a problem. And so I did that. Um, and that's where that book, The Devil and Dave Chappelle came from. Well, yeah, these echoes of that work and the work you're doing now. I mean, one of the things you've been writing about for more than 25 years is is police and mm -hmm. po policing and race. And how do you think about your particular work in this realm? Whether it's, you know, writing about Amadou Diallo mm -hmm. or your first story for The New Yorker in right. 2012, which was on Trayvon Martin. Yeah. How do you think about all of that particular work? And what has it taught you about history, about America, about time? So going back to your previous question, what Africana.com established to me was that I wanted to write about current events, but I wanted to write about current events with historical context. And that the relationship between the past and the present, which is why that column was called Past and Perfect, um, the relationship between the past and the present was like really fertile ground that you could always find ways to understand, you know, what was happening now contextually. And so the emergence of these issues around policing and the, the public consciousness, which has happened over several iterations, um, but I would say the, the beginning of that period was with Trayvon Martin. I met David Remnick at a dinner party and he invited me to submit something to the website. And I was like, which is funny because for most people, an invitation to write for the New Yorker is like huge. I was like, this guy's not serious, <laughs> which is funny. I guess I had the same reaction between David Carr and David Remnick, you know, but it was for very different reasons. I was like, ah, this is just something people say at dinner parties. But I still did the kind of due diligence and sent him an email after, like, great meeting you and so on. And he then connected me via email to Amy Davidson, now Amy Davidson Sarkin. And she said, would you mind writing something about this situation in Florida? Which was not even, a like, people didn't even know the name Trayvon at that point. It was just this thing that was kind of bubbling around on the Internet. And I don't even think there had been substantial, like, media, mainstream media coverage of it at that point. And so I wrote this piece called Trayvon Martin and the Parameters of Hope. And it was about how all of these policing issues had existed prior to Trayvon Martin. And all these things had existed prior to Barack Obama. But the fact that they could coexist with a black president meant that you had to change your understanding of what a black presidency meant. And that Obama had always said, like, the, the biggest obstacle that he was trying to surmount when he was a candidate was cynicism. You know, he wouldn't say racism. Obviously, you couldn't say that. That'd be radioactive. But he was like, you know, the cynics, we will say this. And he was like, you go back to his campaign rhetoric. He said cynicism a billion times, you know, it's like you the cynics. Just, just cross all it, replace yes. it with racism. Yes, and... exactly. You could always, almost always cross out cynic and replace it with racist. Um, and I was like, in that point, he was waging this campaign against cynicism and the doubt that he could become president. But on some other level, 
there was a kind of justified cynicism or skepticism that even with a black president, there was going to be this break with history. And that was the first thing that I wrote for The New Yorker. And at the time, I was like, okay, I've written for The New Yorker. That's good, you know. And I specifically remember Amy saying, why don't you stay with this story? And I was like, okay. I had no idea that not only was the story going to become what it became, but that it was going to be the benchmark for this whole other era that ultimately became the kind of Black Lives Matter era. And that if I published a collection of my New Yorker stuff, my New Yorker columns, which I kind of occasionally give thought to doing, if I published a collection of my New Yorker columns, it would be almost a kind of journalistic history of the, the Black Lives Matter era and the things that have happened in that moment. There were so many quotes about history in your writing that I pulled for this interview. Oh. <laughs> and the the one that like really stands out to me and, and situates itself really interestingly in this conversation is history, according to a wise source of mine, is five minutes ago. Yeah. A friend of mine said that, you know, you know, history is five minutes ago. And I think what he meant was like, we're talking about a very thin membrane between what's happening now and what has happened before. Which was also the thing that led to is another line. I think that I said history is interred in the shallowest of graves. There was this incredible metaphor about history, and this wasn't like something I made up. This was actual real life, which is that I spent a semester in Moscow and um, as a Fulbright in 2010. And, you know, one thing about the United States is that we are kind of ahistorical. We're an ahistorical society, and generally speaking. You know, we don't deeply engage with the past. Russia is not like that. Like, not at all. And, you know, the past is an animate part of the present. They don't really kind of make that same sort of distinction in the way that we do. Uh, especially particular parts of the past, like World War II. Now, of course, they lost 26 million people, which is something that a society is scarred by. You don't forget easily, generally speaking. I visited a high school, and these young people were excitedly telling me about what they were doing as this class project. And it was a class project that no American high school would ever engage in, that I could not imagine any American teenager being eager to participate in. It just is contextually so far out of our frame of reference that it would be illegible to us, you know. Because so many people died in World War II, so many Russians died in World War II, there were a lot of people buried in mass graves. And so these high school students we're going to a national historic site to help flag the places where the bones had begun to rise out of the soil. If you need a more heavy-handed metaphor for the past reasserting itself in the present, I don't know where you would find one. But I think that that also explained a lot of things to me. Like, the past does that literally in that context, but it does it metaphorically all the time. And so we're having to engage with those kinds of elements and understand the ways in which we're shaped by these dynamics that precede us that we, in ways that we're not even necessarily conscious of. And so that's the kind of thing that I got, you know, I, I learned a lot of facts in graduate school. I went to Rutgers for my doctorate in American history. And um, I learned a lot of facts about history, but probably the most valuable things that I learned were like the philosophical element of like what history is and how, what history means. Yeah, your quotes of metaphor, another from a piece you wrote about Rodney King when he died, it was, mm -hmm. it was a sort of obituary slash tribute to Rodney mm -hmm. in his life. You wrote history's encores are often just as brutal as its debut. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't remember writing that, but um, that's a good line, though. <laughs> Tell me about your own interactions with police. I, I read you've had police pull guns on you three times. Yeah, which is something interesting because I I recently wrote a piece about the Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg. He also has had, in his youth, police pull guns on him three times. And we're roughly the same age. I'm a little bit older than him, but both from New York. He's from Harlem. I'm from Queens. And we grew up in a period in which policing, that was acceptable. That was kind of acceptable behavior. And, you know, the most notable of those was, you know, when I was at Howard and I was walking, we were walking a really narrow sidewalk. And, you know, like two of my friends were on the sidewalk and I was walking along the curb next to them. Like sidewalk is literally too narrow for me to walk next to them. But a police officer pulled over and jumped out with his hand on his gun. He didn't draw it, but he jumped out with his hand on his gun and said, get the fuck on the sidewalk. And I was like, what? Like, what? And so, and then he got in his car and drove off. But I was like, yo, what what just happened? And so we had other interactions like that, you know, with police, especially as a young person. And so that came to frame, you know, our understanding. And like my father, who had come north in the Great Migration and who had moved to Harlem and had, you know, lived his life and kind of learned what living in a city meant. One of the first things he told me was as a young person, I mean, I was like 10. He was like, never let a police officer hand you anything. And I was like, why not? And he said, they just want to put your fingerprints on something. And he would say, is this your knife? Is this your gun? Are these your drugs? You know, or whatever. And he was like, uh, anytime you interact with a police officer, you keep your hands at your sides. And um, that was like the start. But... It, Whatever barometer of progress it is or is not, my twin sons are three, so they wouldn't understand this. But when they're older, that's something I absolutely would tell them, too. Like, we still live in that world, but that is relevant information. What would you say to them, I guess, when you do say that to them is it are you you know and I'm thinking here of ta actually mm-hmm. in that beautiful book he wrote mm-hmm. to his son mm-hmm. you know I think that the the trick is to balance um wariness of the dangers of the world with appreciation and wonder for the capacity of beauty and wonderful things to exist in the world And it's kind of like using a knife, you know, which I remember like when my parents would first let me use a knife, like there were all of these things about like, it's sharp, you know, hold it like this, don't do that, don't this. But then you can cook, you know, like you can cut things, you can put this in the pot, you can make this and you can all these other kinds of things. And you always have to bear in mind, like this knife is dangerous and you could like really get hurt badly if you don't handle it with care. But you can also use it to do like these amazing things. And so I think that that would be the type of balance that I would want to strike with them. And my daughter, who is is six years old, you know, I have a daughter who is 30 as well, but, you know, she doesn't like it. Like my advice is (laughs) like, yeah, 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 I've heard it. Um, You know, and so, but for my younger kids, I think that that's something that's important for me to kind of convey to them. Before we finish, I wanted to talk about your appointment as dean mm-hmm. at Columbia Journalism School, which began last summer following six years as a professor mm-hmm. there at the university. Could you speak to how you responded? How did it feel when <laughs> when you were <laughs> propelled into this hot, hot seat, let's say? Uh, um I'll be honest with you. I think it was a little intimidating. So, you know, being a dean was not on my dance card. You know, I hadn't, and, and it was funny because I said this in a meeting once with like a whole group of deans and I'm like, I had to introduce myself 
And I said, this was, you know, not on my radar or something I like, aspired to do. Everyone started laughing. It's like, none of us aspired to be a dean. And I was like, and I thought about it. And it was like, it's such a specific job that like, no, you know, nobody, nobody was like, I want to be a dean when I grow up, you know? And so when the possibility first arose, my initial reaction was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I was very much invested in, you know, my books, my writing, you know, the things that I was doing. And I was like, all right, but let me think about this. Like, what would you do if you were Dean? And then I actually started thinking a little bit about like my own hypocrisy um, because I had written a lot about what was wrong with our democracy about the places where the media had fallen down, about the things we had gotten wrong, about the vital role that journalism plays in preservation of democracy, the need to diversify the institution and the profession. I mean, just all of these things. And, and I said, and here, if you have a possibility to actually do those things, you're like, oh, no, no, no. Like, so it's like, oh, you just want to talk. And... Um, I thought about that and was like, all right, okay. So I don't want to be a talker, but what would you do? And then I started thinking about orienting our reporting so that it is explicitly democracy-oriented, a democracy-focused, and working on accessibility so that you know, as I said in my interview, I said, we have a choice between educating the best journalists in the world and the or the best journalists who could afford us. And I would rather do the former. And so that meant kind of thinking about how the structure um, of the school and tuition and financial aid and all these other kinds of things, things I'm still wrestling with and that my team is still wrestling with. You know, then thinking about diversifying to make sure that journalism looks like the country that it covers, you know, which is, you know, extremely important. It's thinking about like what that moment, you know, presented. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna throw myself my hat in the ring. And by the time, like my initial reaction was like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but by the time I got to the interview phase, I would have been severely disappointed if I did not get it. Because I was like, if I go for it, then I'm going to really like go for it. I'm going to do everything that I can do to try to get this position. President Bollinger, Lee Bollinger called and I think it was like a Wednesday morning. And I was in the midst of like trying to get my daughter dressed. We were trying to get my daughter out the door. And at her school, if you do something good, you get a sticker. And so I was on the phone and, you know, I was explaining to my wife what was happening. Like, I was like, it's the president. I was like, put my hand over the phone and be like, it's the president, you know? And, um, and then my daughter was trying to understand what was going on. So then my wife was explaining to her what was happening. And then, you know, he said, I'd like to offer you the deanship of the journalism school, which was like, incredible. I was like, I didn't even know what to say about that. Um, my daughter said she had like these stickers and she said, you did something good. You can pick any sticker you want, you know, <laughs> which was like the sweetest thing she could have said um, of that. Um, and so somehow or another, I wound up with a sticker of a pig <laughs> and I put it on my phone. Um, and so that was that was, you know, to this day, I think probably the most valuable accolade that I've gotten and um, about, you know, this position. Are you the first black dean? I am. And yeah. I ask this because you've written about the notion of the quote unquote first black. Yeah, I wrote about Colin Powell. Um, and that, <laughs> I should probably revisit that column and see what I said about that. But I wrote about the dilemma of being the first black person in a high profile position. In an all white arena. In an all white arena. Yeah. And I said it's probably like doing a high wire act without a net. And um, well, what was interesting to me is that a student you know, raise that, uh, have like open hours. And I didn't expect that question, um, but 
she just spat it out and said, uh, do you think it's harder for you as the first black dean? I said, that's a really interesting question. I said, I think that there's a, probably a bigger spotlight in some ways. You know, some other ways is just you do what you do. Some other ways people notice, you know, that you're the first black dean of this prestigious journalism school. And, you know, that could translate to pressure if you thought of it that way. Uh, I said, but at the same time, you know, a few days before that, I had been walking down the street, walking my sons to school, and this car the guy was driving stopped, backed up, said, hey, you're the new dean at Columbia, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, good luck, brother, good luck. You know, we're pulling for you. And I said, thank you. And he drove off. And so my son said, is that your friend? And I said, kind of, <laughs> you know? And so I said that, you know, if there is like more pressure that comes with that position or that visibility, there's also all these people who are invested in these ways that, you know, offsets that. So at the end of the day, I don't think that much about it. You know, I'm much more, I'm way, way too busy to like dwell on that. Um, it's just how do we get to the next level? You stated that your focus is democratization and really training journalists for this world of disinformation mm -hmm. that we find ourselves in. An assault on truth, you've called it. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about how you hope to maybe shift certain things within the school to attack that mm -hmm. assault on truth? So one of the things I think is, you know, I think we already do this, but we should be more explicit about it about putting, you know, our reporting up front, you know, so like there's a new kind of model motto that I'm going to unveil, you know, for your listeners first, you know, <laughs> um, but it's reporting begins here. That is, you know, what we do, you know, we are, um, I was like, as a dry cleaning shop, we dry clean, <laughs> you know, there's lots of other stuff that happens, and, but we dry clean, you know, that's our thing. And inside of that, I want to invest in, you know, our capacity to teach digital forensics, which I think is going to be important. It's one of the growth areas, you know, is one of the things that people are hiring around. If somebody sends you a video that they purport shows Russian soldiers committing war crimes in Ukraine, how do you know that video is what it says? And now in the, the uh, automation era, like, how do you know that video is even real? AI, I mean, yeah, how is it? Is it AI? Is it right? Exactly. And so journalists, just like we have fact checking now, we're going to need to be conversant in digital forensics and in that language. How do you operate in a disinformation ecosystem? One of the things that I keep saying, which is like my kind of recommendation is that you know, when we publish, we should have a link to how this story was reported. Meaning, I got an anonymous tip that sent me this document that related to this government agency. And I called that agency to see if this was accurate, uh, which then led me to file this Freedom of Information Act request, which then led me to interview this person who formerly worked there and to look at the documents associated with this lawsuit. On the basis of that, I interviewed the head of this agency. They said this, this, and this. I had evidence that it was actually that, this, and the other. That's how this story worked. How the sausage is made. Right. It's like slow news in a way. I mean, it's unpacking. This is where the, the pig came from. Exactly. But also, I think that was the benefit of being having a social science background. You know, news has traditionally operated on the basis of trust. Social science operates on the basis of distrust, which is that, and, and as do the hard sciences, and unless I can replicate your findings, I don't really believe you. And so we have to find some sort of middle ground, I think, now, because trust is at a high premium. So final question before we finish. There's one last quote of yours, and I couldn't get it out of my head after reading it. Mm -hmm. 
Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Oh, yeah. Did I say that? I mean, a lot of people have used that before. I just, <laughs> it's one of those things that's like, well, yeah, obvious. But right. when you think about it in the context of history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. I had a math teacher, you know, Mr. McCaskill, who pointed out that you could, under certain circumstances, make mistakes in a math problem and still come away with the right answer. And it was like, but you're still wrong. It's like, if you only deal with, that's where the whole show your work thing comes in. If you only deal with like your number, like your product or whatever, your dividend, it's like, oh, okay, like, you know, you nail this. But when you have steps in there, sometimes you will make a mistake and correct that mistake with another mistake you know, and they'll cancel each other out and you'll be like wrong as hell, but have the right answer. And so, you know, we encounter sometimes right for the wrong reason and sometimes wrong for the right reason. Uh, and so that's part of what I think um, makes doing opinion commentary interesting. Jelani, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Extra thanks to our Season 7 presenting sponsor, Lecole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison, Van Cleef, and Arpels. A unique place for learning, Lecole welcomes the general public to the world of jewelry through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications. You can find out more about Lecole at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleef. A-R-P-E-L-S dot com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. To join the Slowdown's new membership program, which provides access to subscriber-only newsletters, in-depth stories, immersive interviews, curated recommendations, and exclusive event invitations, go to slowdown.tv slash subscribe. That's slowdown.tv slash subscribe. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, and Johnny Simon.